I'm caught without having a title for the message. But uh, we'll just have to call it Divine Perspective Continued, number five or something. And um, <clears throat> I want to get into that. But while this week I've just been, you know, preparing and that kind of thing, uh, this scripture from Proverbs has been a lifelong scripture verse for me. And I feel like I should share it today uh, because it might speak to the hearts of some folks in here and their life situation. So this was uh, Proverbs 20 verse 5 and it, like this and in, in most scripture that really means a lot to me comes to me in a time of struggle because that's when it means the most. You know when you're when you're needing something and you get something and it meets your need and doesn't necessarily get rid of your struggle but it tells you it keeps you on target with it. So Proverbs 20 verse 5 says this. Counsel, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, not C-I-L like people, but wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Counsel in the heart of a man. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. So in other words, the wisdom and understanding has some of it has been put innately inside of us by our Creator. And as we go through life and through struggles and through questions and through circumstances and through issues, we come up to things and we're going, why does this happen like this? What, 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 what's going on here that... that how, how am I to navigate this? I don't have the answer, but where's the answer? I need some answers. You ever need answers? I mean, I'm like regular on that page, right? I mean, just every day. Where's the answer? So our Creator, yeah. So our Creator put inside of us, according to this verse, counsel. He puts some inside of us. And it says, counsel in the heart of man. This is decision-making material. What I'm talking about right here. This is decision-making material. Counsel in the heart of man. This, this wisdom and understanding, this knowledge, this decision-making need. Everybody need answers and making decisions? Oh, my God. I mean, is it? I thought that was my career. I just, is that not a career? Just making decisions? I mean, it's just, do they ever slow down? They're just more decisions and more decisions. So anyway, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man of understanding. Say, but a man of understanding. But a man of understanding. Say it again with me. But a man of understanding. understanding. will draw it out. Say it with me. We'll draw it out. Are you a man or a woman of understanding? Are you a man or a woman of understanding? Then you will draw out from that, that created deposit of understanding counsel that you need to make the decisions that you're faced with and you've got to learn how to draw that stuff out from inside of you because it was put in there by your creator you know and this is the only example I've got and I'm right now at the moment but you know the house that, that God had us build as an assembly has never been built before It looks like every house on the market in a Barnuminium style. But the structure is not conventional. But it supersedes California codes. <laughs> 2018 California codes. And somebody that didn't know how to build houses oversaw the building of the structure. Your life, my friend, is a house. And unless you draw the counsel that has been put inside of you by your Creator, you will never build that unique design that you are without getting the counsel that's down inside of you. That's another benefit. Looks like I had all this written out. I don't know, Sony. It's another benefit. It's another benefit of struggle. It's a benefit of the struggle. It's a benefit of the struggle. We've been taught to avoid struggle. 
Somebody just tell me how well that's worked. Somebody just tell you can just get out of it all. No, you cannot. Not on this planet you can't. And so some of the answers of the questions that you have right now are down inside of you from your creator. Just put them there. But if you don't learn how to draw that out of yourself, you'll not have what you need to make the decisions that you're faced with making. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man of understanding or a woman of understanding draws it out. Or is there any teenagers? Yes, there are. Teenagers can draw it out of their own heart. College age graduates can draw it out of their heart. You can draw it out. So that's just an exhortation I've just, just received this week to give you today. Counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Say, draw it out. Draw it out. Say, understanding. understanding. Draw, it out. Draw, it out. draw it out. Draw it out. Father, I pray right now that in the name of Yeshua, our deliverer, Yeshua, our master, Yeshua, our king, Yeshua, our savior, Yeshua, our God, Yeshua, our everything. He's our shepherd. He's our bishop. He's the overseer of our souls. I pray right now for each person in this room that they would begin to learn today. Receive the grace by humbling themselves and receive the grace to draw counsel out of their very own self. It's not the end of everything. It doesn't answer all things, but it is the counsel for them that God has put within them. It actually may lead to getting counsel to make decisions, but there's counsel in the heart of the man. And struggle, struggle, the benefit of struggle is drawing this out. We thank you for it in Yeshua's name. And all those who love him said, I love you. I love you. I want to read this um, song, a line out of this song. I had this in my notes for some time. And um, <clears throat> anybody know the song, and I'll say it just like it's written on here, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Anybody remember that one? Yeah. Do you know the last or the fourth verse in that song? I'm real particular about reading the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Don't just read one, two, and three verses. Read the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? This is what it says. And I was shocked and blessed when I heard it. This is the fourth verse of Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Jesus Loves Me, exclamation point. He will stay close beside me all the way. That this is some. Now can help you can check it out after I finish. If I love him when I die, he will take me home on high. If I love him when I die. Are you kidding me? Is that for real? Is that in that song? It is. And it's true. We gotta love him till we cross the finish line. Amen. You can't stomp along the way. You don't get credit for the race if you stop before you cross the finish line. Is that right? I want to get the credit for finishing. So Yeshua loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him when I die, he will take me home on high. Say la. I don't want to make any statements about <clears throat> the people that sing that a lot may not believe what they're singing. Because if you believe in one saved, always saved, you can't sing that song. Hello? <laughs> I'm just saying. If you believe that, you can't sing that. Not the last verse. Hello? All right. Well... I'm going to start out with another statement that's not going to go over well with the flesh, but I'm going to say it just the same. Why? Is because God is mad? No. Because I'm mad? No. It's because it's true. And we need to hear the truth. The Spirit told me a long time ago, and I'm going to repeat this, weak preaching makes weak people. Weak preaching makes weak people. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of weakness 
in the body of Messiah. Wishy-washy, can't stand up. Everything's okay. Live any lifestyle you want. Be any gender you think you want to be. I mean, it's just, it's just not... It's just that way. But there's a remnant of God's people that are hearing. Their hearts are open. And God is speaking to them. He's telling them the truth about the things that were not true that they believed that were true. They were taught that it was true, and it's not. And God is separating His people from what's not true. Load your bags because you're fixing to move. That's what I'm saying. Moving on up. Moving on up. Take, not to the whether the east side or the great whatever. We're moving on up. Our in, ultimate up is uh, eternally. <laughs> Every time we disobey, we insult the spirit of grace. Every time we disobey, we insult the spirit of grace. I'm going to develop that concept for you. But the weak preaching that we had has taught us that we can just live any old way. And we can, we're going to be okay. Because it's once it's done, it's always done. You have not read Scripture if you believe that. At least you didn't hear what the Scripture was saying when you did read it. Because that's not the case. And if you look in the text that we're going to read, Hebrews chapter 10, oh my God, you're going to know some truth. And you know, um, people don't think when you tell them stuff, so you've got to really reaffirm the relationship when you're talking to people about truth that's going to change the way they're living if they decide to believe it. You've got to tell them the truth, but you've got to reaffirm the relationship. I'm not telling you this to blow you off. I'm not telling you this because I don't like you. I'm not telling you this because I want you condemned. I'm telling you this because I genuinely love you and want you rescued. Jude said, some save by snatching them out of the fire. And so there's a time when the truth comes across forceful. It needs to be spoken forcefully, not compromised, not apologized for, not lowered. So the goats can get over it, but... Every time we disobey, we insult the Spirit of grace. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 10, starting with um, verse 26. I'm going to do my best to read to the end of the chapter. For if we sin purposely after we have received the knowledge of the truth, for if we sin purposefully, intentionally, after we have received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a slaughter offering or sacrifice for sins. Wow. That ought to ring your bell. But some fearsome anticipation of judgment. What? Oh, we weren't supposed to have no fear. But what's this talking about? But some fearsome anticipation of judgment. Why would you be afraid you're going to get judged? You ever been like me, speeding down the road, and all of a sudden there's a police car parked right over there? Yeah. Something happens right in here, and you go, uh-oh, I don't feel so good right at the moment. You see what I'm saying? That's the fear of judgment coming. You see what I'm saying? This is a way we ought to understand living before God. Because I've tried to get across to myself and to you that today we, as if there was no atmosphere, no roof, are sitting, standing directly in front of His everlasting throne with limitless brilliance, radiance coming off of it. You and I may not be able to see it right at this moment, but it doesn't change what's true. It's, that's where we live. And that's bringing this into focus for us. Because a lot of people don't have that. They haven't focused in yet. God's still way off somewhere and I can get away with pretty much anything. And he's maybe asleep or looking the other way. Or, you know, it doesn't really matter because, you know, everybody's doing it and getting away with it, right? But some fearsome, fearsome anticipation of judgment and a fierce fire which is about to consume the opponents. You don't want to be an opponent 
when there's fierce fire coming. I'm just saying you don't want to be an opponent. Listen to this. Verse 28. Anyone who has disregarded the Torah, the instructions of the Father, the, the loving instructions of a father, of Moses, dies without compassion on the witnesses of two or three witnesses. So in other words, in that time, if you sin and there were two witnesses or three that could say, yep, you did it, what happened to them? What was the instructions? What did they use? Rocks, stones. Listen to this. Anyone who disregarded the Torah of Moses dies without compassion, without mercy. That's what it says. It says without mercy. On the witness of two or three witnesses. We're going to visit this verse again in a little more contemporary situation. Listen to this. How much worse punishment... Verse 29, I'm reading from the Scripture translation. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? So, let's tie it back together. In Moses' day, you know, Moses wrote the Scripture down in the first five books. But who's the author? Yahweh, Jehovah. He's the author. So I know they give Moses the credit, but I tell you who Moses gives the credit to. You hear what I'm saying? And so it's really God's Word. Moses just wrote it down. He was inspired. It was the Spirit, etc. But it was just Moses just was the writer, not really the author, because it would be plagiarism because it was somebody else's thoughts, right? <laughs> he wrote down. Okay. <laughs> we won't dig that too deep. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who is trampled under the Son of God underfoot? I quote this from memory out of King James, and I'm reading a different translation, and I'm sorry I garble it up. But I quote it from another translation. When I go to read it, I don't even see the words. I just read what's on my brain in the quote. But anyway, so that's why I'm... So let me read it without trying to get two translations going at one time. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot? So in other words, if you died without mercy, if you died without mercy because you got caught violating the Torah, the law, the instructions, the word, and without compassion, you were killed. That's what it says. But it goes on to say, what if you act like that now that the Son of God has been crucified? How much worse punishment is going to come to those who don't obey God now that the Son of God has been mutilated and hung on a cross for sin? How much worse punishment do they deserve? It gets more in telling. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve? How much? He's asking you and me a question. What do we think ought to be the just deserves of someone who tramples underfoot what the Son of God did? What say the people? How much worse punishment should be done? How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot? Counted. Listen to this. He's not stopping with that statement. He's going to develop this. And this is what the Spirit is saying and it's what he's saying today to God's people. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common. Now, what does the blood of Yeshua, what does it do? What does it do? Because you've got to decide what it does before you can decide whether somebody's treating it as common or not. Now, common in this case means profane. 
It means something that would be unset apart. That's what the, see where it says here, uh, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common. So in other words, it doesn't set you apart, but you treat it as though it's common. Something that's profane. Something that really has no value. Something that really doesn't do anything. It's just common. Well, fescue grass is common, so there it grows. You're, you're treating your shoe like something common. You don't value what the blood, the sacrifice, the shed the blood, we don't value it for what it does. Is the blood whitewash? Like whitewash, paint, that they used to whitewash everything. You just throw some whitewash on it to cover it up, keep it from looking so bad. Is the blood of the covenant just whitewash? I'll just throw some on the side of the building or the side of the house or whatever, just to make it look okay, because it's got a lot of problems in it. And just FYI, if you put more solids in it, uh, it'll cover it better. So I'm just saying I know how to do that good. But uh, anyway, just take some drywall mud and whip it in there. And more solids, it'll cover everything up at that point. But anyway, the severity of the judgment of the fierce fire of Yahovah. If you died under the covenant of Moses... Under the uh, two witnesses or three witnesses, with, you would die without mercy. What is going to happen to the people that have used the blood of Yeshua as whitewash? It just it just covers up my sin. I don't really have to change because there's blood shed and I'm just forgiven. But this doesn't require anything of me. I don't have to change nothing. I just flip out a forgive me and it's all over. You might, you will feel some forgiveness because God is so kind. He's so kind, so merciful, so compassionate, so loving, so wanting people to, to, to get rid of their sins. That He'll do it. He'll help people that don't love Him. They're in crisis. And they have no intention of which one I was at one time. God help me, I'm in trouble. I can't get out. And He'd come help you anyway. But that doesn't change your eternal life. That doesn't change your destiny. That doesn't do anything for your destiny. And so, He's not finished. I'd have been happy if he'd have just finished with those two things. But he's got another one. He's fixing to say this. Listen to what he says. I'm going to read the whole verse for impact. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common, and insulted, insulted the Spirit of grace? You know, the question is how much worse punishment should be given to those who insult the spirit of grace. What are you talking about, writer of Hebrews? What are you talking about, spirit of God? What I got to know what is going on here. What are you trying to say to me? I'm telling you, when we disobey... We insult the spirit of grace. And I know grace is still just a word in a book to a lot of folks. But it's a living person to me. It is a manifestation of an extension of what was accomplished through the Messiah in the spirit of God. Grace. Say grace. Grace is amazing. When you think about what you were before he chose you. And the favor that he showed on you and brought you out of that to where you are now? What kind of favor? What kind of, what kind of going, you know, if I had to reach out to people like that, I probably wouldn't do it. Would you? I mean, as ugly as I was, I wouldn't even reach out and help me. 
you know, I mean, in the spirit, you know what I'm saying? I just wouldn't even reach out to that guy. I just drove on by, you know. But God's not that way. He's reaching out to the whole world. Every person. No person is without excuse because he is making sure. Person on the planet. In a way that they can understand and respond. But when we disobey, it's an insulting. Now, what is it? You know, I don't know what you do, but I know what I do. When I insult the Spirit of Grace, when I disobey, I have to ask forgiveness immediately. I don't leave things unchecked. I don't leave things undone. I'm counting too much on my relationship with the Father to get me through what I'm going through. I can't just, oh, well, it's, you know, I lied again. Uh, test me. Tell me how many liars get in heaven. Just tell me. I asked someone in this congregation, I said, if you lie every day of your life and claim to be a believer, where are you going when you die? There are no liars in heaven. There are none. There are no immoral people. There are no drug addicted. And I'm talking about drug addiction. I'm not talking about I, I'm on medication. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about drug addiction where you're using drugs for your own personal pleasure or whatever. What if God's telling you to do something and you go, huh? I didn't do it. And you just go about your life. You think he forgot? You think he's got a bad memory? You think he don't know what happened? You just think it in your head. He's got a record of it. You just desire it in your heart. He's got a record of it. And if you say it, he's going to hold you accountable to it. You know what I'm saying? Lord. So we've got to learn that every time we transgress, transgression is the violation of his will. That's why they even got that word transgression because it means when you supersede your will over his will that's called sin that's called I've got to repent that's called I got to take responsibility let me because if you and I don't take responsibility for the sin that we commit we never will learn how to stop doing it you can't learn how to change if you don't know what needs to be changed counsel in the heart of man, it's like deep water. But a man, a woman of understanding will draw it up and out of them. There's also something there called the Spirit of God to help you out too. You can draw on. But when we don't obey, when we just say, oh, grace covers it all, you know, I don't have to change nothing. Grace has got it all. That's not the truth. That's not the truth. That's a lie. The spirit of grace that is the work that the Messiah did on the cross and the spirit that he did it in and then passed it on to us when he went to the Father. It's the spirit of grace. I realize that's not talked about much in the scripture on the face surface. But if you look up the word grace, G5485, G5485 in your Strong's, it's used 156 times. So there's a lot of talking about grace in there. Grace is not just God overlooking your faults. Grace teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust. It also imparts to you the desire and ability to do what God is requiring. So you know when you and I don't obey the Spirit like we should, it's a matter of there's not enough humility in our lives to accommodate for that situation. So what do you do? You've got to learn to take inventory, not condemnation. That's not the spirit I'm talking about. Because most people don't deal with stuff because they get condemned when they try to deal with something that's wrong. That's not the spirit of God. That's not what I'm preaching. But that is probably inherent inside of you. Because of some undealt with issue. Some sinful issue that happened to you. And you haven't dealt with it. 
And so you don't deal with it. You just try to stay away from it. How far are you going to get when it lives inside you? Not going too far. So what, what is this about, Pastor? What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that we cannot discredit the shed blood of the Messiah and just live how we want to live. We can't just make decisions the way we want to make them. We just can't go there or do that when he know, when you know, I'm talking about wrong things, things that we know in the scriptures wrong. You just can't go do that stuff and not deal with why you're doing it. Because that is treating the blood of the covenant. That's treating the blood of the covenant as common. You see, the blood of the Messiah forgives you. When you ask, there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Right? So when the blood was shed, you can get forgiveness. But John chapter 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our faults, he's faithful and just to forgive us and do what? Cleanse us. You're trampling underfoot the blood of the covenant when you just get it to forgive you and don't let it cleanse you. The blood, that's what was wrong with the animal sacrifices. They couldn't remove that innate desire of doing wrong. The blood of animals couldn't remove it. It's what the chapter starts off with. Why is he telling us this? He's telling us because he loves us and because he wants us to know it so that when the final finish line is reached, you won't be discredited. How much worse punishment? Oh, my God. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common, and insulted the spirit of grace, the spirit of favor? For we know him who has said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Jehovah. And again, Jehovah shall judge his people. So, so is vengeance is mine is... is I shall repay. Is that not what the writer here is saying is the same as the very next sentence? Is he talking about two different subjects here or is he talking about the same subject? Let's analyze it just a little bit. Vengeance is mine. Jehovah shall judge. Hmm. I'm thinking that's pretty close to saying the same thing. Vengeance is mine. I shall repay, says Jehovah. And again, Yahweh shall judge whose people? people? Whose people? His people. That's why it urges us to not leave things undone. There have been times where I've had habitual sins in my life. And if I have not confessed every one of them as sin every time I committed that sin, ask for forgiveness, ask for cleansing, and transformation every time. Now, there's sometimes I do things that I don't know are wrong, and that comes up later on. But if you know that you do wrong, you need to ask forgiveness right then. Don't wait to some better time, and don't buy the lie, well, you don't feel like it right now. I feel condemned right now. Oh my God, say it quicker. Uh, forgive me. I repent. Help me change. Cleanse me. I don't want to be like that anymore. Just do it that quick because you know how quick He'll give you forgiveness, right? I mean, you just go, yes, forgive me. He's like on it, man. He, I mean, there's no, there's no waste of time delay if you just ask Him to forgive you. He forgives you. Listen to this. Verse 31. It is a fearsome fearsome to fall into the hands of a living God. But remember the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a great struggle with sufferings. 
drawing out that counsel within your heart so you can make good decisions. On the one hand, you were exposed to reproaches and pressures, and on the other hand, you became sharers with those who so were treated. For you sympathized with me in my change, and you accepted with joy the seizure of your possessions. You're kidding me, right? I'm going to read that again. Just make sure I read that right. For you sympathized with me in my chains, and you accepted with joy the seizure of your possessions, knowing that you have a better and a lasting possession for yourselves in the heavens. So these people that he was writing to sympathized with Paul in his chains, or the writer of Hebrews, excuse me, in his chains, and the people that were connected accepted with joy the loss of their possessions. You're kidding me. Nope, I'm not. That's what it says. Knowing that you have a better and lasting possession. Right. Say it with me. Knowing that you have a better and lasting possession for yourselves in the heavens. Has anybody got that? Yeah. You got that? Do not then lose your boldness, with which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the desire of Elohim, you receive the promise. For you have need of endurance. Say endurance. endurance. One of the traits, Susan and I were talking about this morning, and one of the traits of the end time body of Messiah is the capacity for endurance. Endurance. Say endurance. endurance. Say endurance. In this, this is going to require greater endurance. Greater endurance. Working through, walking through struggles and difficulties like never before. And we're going to have to be resolved in our hearts to humble ourselves, let God deal with our issues, and persevere. And I, don't, I hope I'm not going too far away with this, but God gives us adversarial circumstances. He uses adversaries in the lives of His people so that he can deal with the issues in their heart. So they'll come to the place of saying, God, I got a struggle. What's the remedy? But he's using spiritual forces of wickedness. Hallelujah. Y'all dealing with any spiritual forces of wickedness? Well, I'm just telling you, we're fixing to see a new breakthrough. God's about to break a new through. I'm just so crazy about it. It's just awesome. He's doing it. I can be excited about what he's doing, right? But I'm telling you, it's, I've never heard or seen. You know, and I just want to declare the goodness of God. Can I do that? Yeah. Exodus 34.10 says, I'm making a covenant with you that I will do signs and wonders in your life that has never been seen by any people in any nation. The price of admission is worth the show. If you want to pay the price of letting God deal with your sins and not trampling underfoot the blood of the Son of God, not counting His, the covenant of blood as common, not insulting. You ever been ignored by somebody? They just ignored you. I mean, they just act like you weren't there. Would you call that an insult? You know, when we don't obey God, He's insulted by it. He's insulted by it. Who's running the show? And why are we acting like we're running the show? Because we're not running the show. I don't know anybody's running the show. Not besides Him. And when we don't obey the prompting of the Spirit, the Spirit of grace, I want people to understand the Spirit of grace. It's a... It's a it's a personal thing. It's a, it's, it's a, gosh, it's just so real. You, listen, I, I've told you this 20 times or 40 times. Every time you open your scripture and read it, every time you try to pray, every time you're driving down the road and you want to pray, do you know that's the spirit of grace? Or you just think you're that good? Huh? That's, that's God operating on your physical person, man. Every time, in every environment, that's Him operating in your life. 
You've got to learn to recognize that, cooperate with that, and yield to that in every way. Because the good news is the more sin abounds in this world, in this nation, the more grace that's available. Now, don't go out and sin so you think you're going to get grace. Read Romans 3 and that'll set you out straight on that. That ain't going to happen. But, let's finish. Do not then lose your boldness, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the desire, done the desire. Say, done the desire. Done the desire. Desire is code for God giving you desire by grace. Amen. That's where you get the desire to do what's right. You didn't just get born again and all of a sudden want to do everything right. You got the spirit of grace in your life and it wants to do everything right. If Messiah lives in you, what do you want to do? Please the Father. He said, I want to do everything. My whole life goal is to please my Father. Thus, all of life, the highest goal of life is a relationship with the Father. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the desire of Elohim, what's going to happen before you get the reward? You've done the desire of Him. You will receive the promise. You don't get the promise before you do the will of God. You get the promise afterwards. Okay? For yet a little while, He who is coming shall come and shall not dis delay. You know, I'm going to somewhat finish with this, I guess. Can I finish with this? I'll try to. In Moses' day, two or three witnesses, and you were guilty of sin, what did they do with you? They stoned you with rocks. How much more severe punishment is coming for those who trampled underfoot the Son of God, made the, cup, the blood of the covenant common, and insulted the Spirit of grace, who is going to throw the rocks next time. Who's going to throw the rocks next time? I had just looked up, but I didn't write down the reference. But one of the angels in one of the last chapters of Revelation, somewhere about 16, 17, says they're going to cry out for the rocks and they're going to hurl a rock from the heavens. Revelation 18, Susan's telling me, who's going to throw the rocks next time? God himself. You know what's going to happen? People are going to ask for it because death will be better than life if you're going to be separated from God. 1821. And one mighty messenger picked up a stone like a great millstone and threw it in the sea. Saying, with such a rush, this great city Babel shall be thrown down and shall not be found at any more at all. So it's going to be this rock thrown down. There's another one in an earlier chapter where they're going to throw a stone. I'm just telling you. We got to change the way we're living. I'm a part of that. I'm not preaching down. I'm preaching level. We're all in the same place, right? Everybody I know is standing on the same floor. I don't know anybody that's above that. So, what are you going to do with the Spirit of Grace? What are you going to do? Next time the Spirit of Grace is saying... Do this. And you go, I ain't doing that. You know, let me... People don't mind preaching that puts a fault on somebody else. The devil's the problem. The other person's the problem. People don't mind preaching like that. But what they do mind is with preaching that puts responsibility on them. That's when they're looking for a new place to go. I don't like it there anymore. It's not comfortable. See, we don't care. Preach about the bad people. The Illuminati. Preach about those people. I just wear them out. They're, they're guilty. Get it. That ain't going to help you much. 
What's going to help you is surrender to the Spirit of grace and stop insulting God by our disobedience and not applying the blood to not just forgive our sins, but to cleanse us. 1 John 1, 9 says you need to ask for cleansing. So, I don't know. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm going to finish with that, I suppose. Did I finish reading the chapter? Because I sure did want to finish reading. 616. Going to throw a rock, ain't they? Going to throw a rock. I didn't finish reading it. I'm going to read it right here. <clears throat> oh. No wonder that didn't look familiar. It's wrong. Chapter 10. For yet a little while, he who is coming shall come and shall not delay. Shall not delay. For yet a little while, he who is coming shall come. He's not delaying. He doesn't want you and me to procrastinate. Amen. Ain't nobody in here procrastinating, are they? Huh? What? When well, you dealt with that years ago, right? Huh? You know that's wrong and you're not still doing that, are you? Are you insulting the spirit of grace by your procrastination and thinking that's okay? What are you talking about? Who is your master? Who owns you? You still own yourself? Tell me what? For yet a long while, he who is coming shall come and not delay. But the righteous shall live by faith. Any righteous in here? I didn't hear many. Is there any righteous in here? I think I'm, I'm, I was, I the holder was in the right place. But the righteous shall live by belief. What does that mean? Not just he says, I believe. But inherent in believing is changing. It's like inherent in listening, Shema, is obedience. You're listening to obey. But if the righteous shall live by belief, but if anyone draws back, my being has no pleasure in him. But if anyone draws back, who's anyone? That's a pretty broad term. Is he talking about anybody? He's talking about Yeshua loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him when I die, he will take me home on high. There's no drawing back here. You see, when you get born again, you have no past anymore. There's nothing to go back to. Not really. Many people go back, but there's nothing to go back to. There are no people back there. There's no mama, there's no daddy, there's no brother, there's no sister, there's no baby, there's no wife, there's nobody back there. There are no circumstances back there. There's nothing to go back to. It becomes all in front of you. Yes, you'll have to deal with the issues that you didn't come over behind you, but now they're in front of you. And now you have the help of God. Amen. The blood of the covenant, if you don't treat it as common will change your life and transform you into victory. I can't stop. But we are not of those who draw back to destruction. What happens to those who draw back? Destruction. But we, but of belief to the person, to the preservation of life. So faith leads, endurance leads to the preservation of life. I want to just read one scripture to you from the book of John and maybe I'll quit. I'm not sure. But this is John chapter 8. And we like these. We like this text. We like verse 32 especially. Which says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Everybody likes that verse, right? But if you just quote that by itself, it's out of context. You have cheated, insulted the Word of God. You've insulted it. Why have you insulted it? Because that's not what it means. That's not the application of it. That's not the truth of it. You're going to have to back up a verse or two and go forward a couple verses if you really want what it says. So let's do that.
Verse 30 says, And he was speaking these words, many believed. So we, yeah, many believed when he said that. And then he says his crowd thinning thing. So Yehoshua said to those Yehudim, those Jews who believed him, he said, if, you're kidding me, right? We could do without those ifs, couldn't we? I'd just rather not if it. But if, say if. 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 You stay in my word, or if you continue in it, if the word keeps transforming your life, if it keeps transforming who you are until you start looking more and more, you cannot live with excuses of not obeying. You have the power of the Almighty through His Son to change you and we insult Him when we say you're not sufficient to change me. We ignore Him. He gets insulted. You know why sometimes you can't feel the Spirit of God in a service? He insulted him. And he ain't hanging with you. And you have to go back in your closet and try to reach for something that makes you feel good about yourself. All that you got to do is say, I was wrong. Forget me. Change me. I don't want to be that way no more. And then just keep enduring. He's going to come through. He's never failed any person ever. Never. 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 Never failed a single person who trusts Him. If you stay in my word, you are truly my taught ones. So only those who stay in the word are real disciples. That is, they're transformed by the Word. doesn't mean just reading it. You can just read it and it have no impact on you. But when he's talking about it, he's talking about changing. There's a divine interchange. That's what it means to be born again. There's a divine interchange. You're not who you were. You're somebody new. So, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now you get to go, yes. I know the truth because I've been continued in it. I'm free. There's nobody that can take it away from me. God gave it to me. Here it is. You want it? There it is. If you don't want it, there it is. Make up your mind. Because I want to go down just a couple more verses and finish this. They answered him. This is the religious people. They answered him. So I'm going to get some religious answers. We are the seed of Abraham. We've been in church since we were in a basket. <laughs> My grandma took me when I was little. Every day, every Sunday. And they answered and said, We're the seed of Abraham and have been servants to no one at any time. They thought their religious had set them free. How do you say we should become free? Listen to the master's answer. You got a master? What's his name? Yeshua. Yeshua. Verse 34. Yehoshua answered them saying, Truly, truly, I say to you. So he's making this absolutely crystal clear, right? No gray area here. And Yehoshua answers them saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who... Do, everyone doing sin, I'm quoting from a translation in my head instead of what I'm reading. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone doing sin is a servant of sin. What? I thought I was set free. I don't have to worry about this sin thing no more. But if we're still doing sinful things that we know we shouldn't, the qualifier is we know we shouldn't, and if we do know, and we're doing it anyway, every occasion has to be gotten under the blood. You have to ask forgiveness for the sin you commit. And you have to do it every time until it's done. You can walk away feeling good, but if you don't get transformed, you will do it again and again and again for the rest of your life. And you get to the end, you go, why didn't that work for me? And he answered, truly, truly, I say, everyone doing sin is a servant of sin. Listen to this. And a servant does not stay in the house forever. No eternal security right there. 
No one saved, always saved right there. Y'all think I'm making this up. Just read it for yourself. Believe it yourself. And a servant does not stay in the house forever. A son stays forever. If then the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If God through his son works in you, The best thing is you're not insulting the Spirit of grace. You're not trampling underfoot the Son of God. And you're not making the blood of the covenant as something that's common. What do you call a man or a woman who's intimate with just anybody? What do you call them? Whore. 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 Prostitute. We are prostituting. God's truth. When we continue to not repent, not turn away, not by the grace of God, not by mustering up the strength, pulling up your boots, straps, and going for it, but surrendering, humbling yourself before God and asking His intervention every time. We are prostituting the truth of the Scripture. And it's coming to a close, my friends. Coming to a close. I was taught this way back 40 years ago now. I didn't know I was old enough to do anything 40 years ago. But it's true. Keep short accounts with God. Don't believe the lying spirit that tells you you don't have to confess that sin to Him and ask forgiveness. You do. Not only do you need to ask forgiveness, but you need to ask for cleansing so that you don't ever do it again. Then you're not the master of that sin when he cleanses you and the son has set you free and free indeed. Father God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us enough to tell us the truth. God, we would trade nothing for our relationship with you. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of reputation, prestige, ministry, relationship. There's nothing that we would trade for our relationship with you. Father, I ask right now in my own life and for this congregation, those who might be watching by the Internet, that they would humble ourselves. We would humble ourselves before you and let you show us sin without condemnation. You're not here to condemn us. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. And Father, we need that attitude. We need to hear that spoken into our lives enough until we get it. Until we're transformed. Until we're truly set free. And that sin has no place in us anymore. Father God, help us. We humble ourselves. We say we cannot do it without the powerful effect of the covenant and the blood sacrifice of Yeshua, our Messiah. And the efficacy, the the completing of the powerful work that He's done, transforming us. For Father, we are not those who draw back, but we want to persevere to the reward of the promise. In Yeshua's name, so be it.